heard a lot already today about the challenges that the U.S. is facing. We have $800 billion a year defense budgets. They're already quite high, so there's not a lot of room to go up. And we've just seen from Ru the Russia-Ukraine conflict that some of the expensive platforms like tanks, fighter jets, aircraft carriers, expensive ships are pretty vulnerable to new and innovative technologies, small, inexpensive things like drones. So what ingenious creative ideas is the Pentagon going to come up with to be more resilient and tech forward? And there's no one better to talk about these two things across the bridge between innovation in Silicon Valley and between the Pentagon than Reid Hoffman, who's one of our most innovative and thoughtful tech entrepreneurs and also a long time and again member of the Defense Innovation Board, and Lauren Selby, who has been pushing a lot of these really critical reforms as the chief of naval research, including the use of smaller sea drones and other replaceable platforms as a hedge strategy. And we've got Mary Louise Kelly back, no one better to interview them. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, we are indeed going to continue with what has already emerged as a really interesting this conversation this afternoon about the military, about innovation, but yes, focusing specifically on the technology piece of it. Are we spending money on the right gizmos? What should we not be spending money on? Or, or what we are doing in terms of tech, is it actually keeping us safe? What does innovation look like as we tread farther into the 21st century. And I want to amplify just slightly the lovely uh, intro that Anya just gave you to. Reid Hoffman, I will introduce to you as entrepreneur, product, and business strategist, investor, and podcaster. This is how his LinkedIn profile describes him. And since among his other accomplishments, he is the co-founder and executive chairman of LinkedIn. I figured, I figured we could rely on it. So welcome. Um, and, and Admiral Selby, I just want to amplify for you, we identified you as the chief of naval research. In case it isn't clear, that means he is in charge of scientific research in the US Navy. So I really do have two no better people to, to look at this with. Um, I want to start with the ostensible title. They have titled this particular session, Turning the Titanic, um, which obviously conjures up an image of a really big ship in treacherous waters. It also um, is a story that did not end well. The Titanic sank. <laughs> it's not something we want to repeat. Admiral, you first, and then, and then I want to hear from you on this as well, Reed. Is it an apt image for the state of our defense technology yeah. in 2022? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of struggle with that, too, because kind of, you, you kind of know the end of that story. You're like, ah, I don't think that's how we want this one to end. So I, I hope not. I, I get the analogy. I see where we're trying to go. But I, I do think that the problem we're, we're facing is we have two kind of things we've got to do. One is we've got to maintain, and to Secretary Kendall's point, modernize the existing weapon systems we have today, because they are, in fact, effective. They do, in fact, provide great effect. They do provide a deterrent value. However, I do see a future that is going to be very different, and I think it does involve hundreds or thousands of smaller, my word, attritable, cheap, autonomous sensors and things some could be crewed, but many will be uncrewed, okay? And I think th what we have to do is figure out how you make the transition between the two. And to do that, the leaders that are in charge have to be somewhat ambidextrous. So if you've ever read the book, Lead and Disrupt, okay? So he talks about having to hold two kind of competing things in your mind. One is modernizing existing things with innovation to do that, or else you become irrelevant and either go out of business if you're a company or you you lose if you're a military. And you also have to be very exploratory and you gotta be looking for those technologies that can actually change the game and be disruptive. Now, disruptive is an interesting term because you only know disruption kind of in the rear view, right? But you've gotta be striving for those things that your gut, your intuition says, are gonna change the game and go for that. But how do you do the two of them? And so that, I think that's the challenge that I face, and I hope we can talk more about that. Yeah, I would love to get some specifics. But first, Reed, how are you thinking about this, turning the Titanic? So we're gonna to try to make sure that the band doesn't just play on, um, is I think the, to elaborate the metaphor. Um, I do think that one of the things that we all see in this current world is that technological um, development is accelerating. Take, for example, something, you know, probably familiar to many of the folks here, which is, you know, cars 
are moving from mechanical engineering paradigms to software engineering paradigms, where a car is essentially a data center that's moving around with a set of sensors and other kinds of things and will eventually be a platform itself. And that's something that is immediately tactile to everybody and you can see this changing transport everywhere uh, for doing it. And part of the reason I open with that example is actually I think this is part of how software is transforming the world. Um, if you want to be you know, extremely uh, visual about it, you can say software is eating the world. And yet, um, one of the things I think we desperately need to do when we think about innovating and modernizing is how do we bring software into the missions that the services are doing in a much more central way, not in a, oh, I have a two-year tour of duty as a specialty, um, what is my technological planning in terms of what my capabilities need to be uh, for the future, uh, how does that play out? Because, you know, to give you a, a crisp, another historical example of how potentially concerning this is, is healthcare.gov, which, you know, the prime contractors spent $300 million, uh, spent, you know, years developing, failed. Uh, $5 million, 15 people in modern software developed over the RFP spec. So the prime contractors, to, to, to my you know, point of view, are so many decades behind in software, I don't know which decade they're in. Right? And this is challenging when you get to, okay, how is it we bring the right kinds of software competence? Now, the other threads that I would also point out in this is that the commercial sector is developing at a huge speed. One is software. We're seeing it happen in artificial intelligence. The, the, the DALI image generation has just actually opened up this morning uh, for something that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, but there's a huge set of things in it. But also, this is happening in, in areas that you might con formerly consider just strategic. There is multiple startups doing nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, supersonic planes, electronic flying vehicles, et cetera, all of which in terms of the question of when you have the various missions within the, uh, the various services and the overall Department of Defense is how do we stay pace with what's going in commercial? Because when you create an RFP and say, well, I want something that's very specific here, you start aging the moment you ship the RFP, especially when it gets the software. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that because that's actually one of the premises for my way to try to transform the way we do business. We tend to want to set a requirement, okay? That's what the military likes to do. We want to define a requirement, and we want to do that because the way our budget cycle works, about two to two and a half years ahead of the time when you actually start building or coding that thing. By that, ha by that time, on the scales we work at today, that thing has been overcome by events at least two, if not three or more times. So instead of setting a requirement, we've got to become problem focus. What is the problem that the warfighter has that we have to solve? And let's go out to industry, academia, and see who's got a solution. And then find ways to rapidly scale that t to something that we can hand to a warfighter in okay. months, not years. Yeah, so I want to get specific with both of you, um, because what you're saying sounds absolutely right and like total common sense, but it also sounds kind of amorphous and squishy. Like, I want to understand what you actually mean. Admiral, when you talk about we need smaller, we need cheaper, um, first off, what counts as cheap when you are, are dealing with a multi-billion dollar if I, if I'm Well, if you've got a multi-billion dollar budget, cheap is probably, maybe it's 10 million. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's 10 million. Mm -hmm. and it, I could still buy hundreds with that cost at the, at the budgets I've got today. Yeah. Right? And be specific about what that would look like, like one, so, one thing. So when I came in this job two years ago, I, I looked at what we did as the, as the Office of Naval Research. And so I support the Navy and Marine Corps. I'm Naval, not Navy, Navy and Marine Corps. And the team said, hey, you're about the future of naval power. I go, okay, that's interesting, but I really think we're about reimagining naval power. What is the, What should it look like? And then more importantly, how do we then figure out how to get leadership on board and then get us to that future vision of what it should be. As I kind of surveilled what has been happening in the world, we've made this transition from an industrial kind of era to a very digital software-based era. And as I look at the systems that we are starting to see in the commercial sector, not in the military, there are a lot of things like Teslas, like autonomous quadcopters, like uh, UUVs that are doing oil and gas exploration. That is the sector that I think we need to tap into to provide solutions for the military to go cause effects. Maybe we're just surveilling, looking for stuff, but maybe I'm actually delivering something that can cause a kinetic or non-kinetic effect. That's kind of what I'm looking at. And so it's small, okay, so I call it the small, the agile, and the many. Small, it's, it's literally smaller, it's, it's, it's 
less complex. Maybe it's single mission instead of having five or six missions, so it's cheaper. Uh, Agile, it, it might have physical agility, and that's not, not to say it's not important, but the agility I'm talking about is the agility to rapidly adapt and change what it looks like, what it sounds like, what the acoustic pattern is, what the radio frequency pattern looks like. So the adversary is always left guessing what's coming next. And then of course many. If it's cheaper and attributable, I can buy hundreds or thousands. That's kind of the concept. And is it an either or? No. Um, I mean, take the, the extreme counter example, an aircraft carrier. Right. When we're all right. gathered back here 20 years from now, is the Navy are you repairing our existing carriers? Are you commissioning new ones? Do they go yeah. away? Do we still need them, but we need the small things too? Okay, so it, it's a transition. So go back 100 years. 1922, USS Langley, first aircraft carrier for the US Navy. Carrier aviation was in its infancy in, in 1922. Most of the senior leaders in the Navy said battleships were the thing that was gonna win the war. And that prevailed until December 8th, 1941 when that eight battleships were either sunk or destroyed in Pearl Harbor at that point. Luckily, there had been a cadre of uh, kind of rebellious and disruptive officers in the Navy who said, you know, we got these airplanes, we ought to figure out how to fly these off, off ships. You might have to make that like, cause some kind of effect. So that cadre was allowed to develop aircraft carriers and strategies. The submarine force also learned a lot in World War I from really the Germans, and we took that to our tactics. So fortunately, on December 8th, 1941, we had a backup plan. We had a hedge strategy. Primary asset, battleships, the hedge, submarines, and aircraft carriers. And that's what won World War II. Here's the bad news. We've been operating with the same force structure, carrier strike groups, since like 1945. Now, they are incredibly capable platforms, and so we cannot walk away from them today. We have to slowly start introducing these other autonomous systems and sensors, first operating in concert with, extending the horizon of, providing targeting services like we're doing, in, like not we, but like Ukraine is doing right now in, you know, we quadcopters targeting Russian tank formations. We need to do that in concert with, and over time, as endurance improves, autonomy improves, collaborative behavior improves, we will slowly see those will start carrying more and more of the load. So I think by 2050, 2070, you're gonna see a totally different makeup of the force, kind of like we did 100 years ago. It totally transformed through World War II into the carrier strike groups, and I think it's time again to look again at what's, what's our next head strategy for the U.S. Navy going forward. Well, obviously, the Admiral is much more expert on the Navy than I'm, but I'm going to take a slightly accelerated point of view on this. Um, I would say that um, he's exactly right that we need to be focusing on, like, what's happening with drones, what's happening with sensors, what are the things they're deploying. But like all combat is a function of speed, right? This needs to be done as fast as possible. This 2050 yeah. is too late. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so I think the focus on that is the, is the, is the potential uh, immediate and now shift to primary is, I think, very important. Now, if I'm not in charge of this, I understand that usually the Navy is constrained by Congress on these kind of things, but I wouldn't build another aircraft carrier, <laughs> right? I think it's like hypersonic missiles just referred to, very challenging to defend those in that, and there would be other things. The kind of things I would be focusing on is software, I'd be focusing on what are the things that we could build out of this amazingly fast cycle that's happening with the commercial, and how can that be amplified for what we're doing? And so, you know, specifics are like drones, like if you say the $14 billion for an aircraft carrier, plus what other expenses are, you put that into software capabilities, that could be extremely important. You mentioned software several times now, and that some of it is so old you can't even tell what decade it's in. What decade is the U.S. military software in? Well, it kind of depends on where it is. Um, and, you know, some of the ship's software systems are safeguarded by keeping them air-gapped because that's the only thing that you can do to possibly do that, and that's, that's you know, worrisome, would I, would, uh, you know, to put it politely. And I think that the... Uh, that the question is, like for example, if I had been, you know, I think it's right to have a, a space force, but if I were focused on what we need is we need like a digital ROTC, a West Point that's equivalent to, 
you know, kind of digital and software. We need that going into a service, whether it's modeled on, you know, Israeli 8200 unit or other kinds of things. But the training and education yes, needs to change. the whole thing. Yeah. And the talent and what's going, because like if I, it's only a brief rotation, like I do a two or three and oh, I get an exception, I could do another two or three years. That's not the competence of knowing where software can play in, because it plays across everything. It plays across how a soldier is equipped. It plays across Intel. It's like, what are we gonna do with tanks? We're like, well, how does that play with drones, et cetera? It's across the entire stack. Just to be clear, 2050s yeah. when I'm thinking we're tr making the transition to these things that are carrying the load. We've got to start today, to your point. And I, I personally think that this is not just military. I think we've got about eight years. We've got this, the 2020s is the defining decade for this century. If we as a nation don't get it right by the end of this decade, we are going to be on the other side of the curve when it comes to China. We've got to turn that tide now. This is a whole government approach. We've got to change the way we do industry. We've got to look at the way we resource things. We've got to change the game totally. I mean, I, I, that's a whole other topic. I, I mean, how is the U.S. doing compared to our chief adversaries? I mean, Ukraine has been an example of many things, but one is that the Russian military is still fighting like it's 1985 in many ways. I do think that we still have probably the finest capabilities on the planet. Okay, now that said, are there some disruptive, orthogonal kind of capabilities that could be coming to threaten us? Absolutely. That's why I'm saying we've got to really up our game. But I do think right now we've got, we've got incredibly capable people is probably the best thing we've got. Most incredibly trained force, I mean incredibly disciplined and trained force that are motivated to really carry the, carry the fight. And they know their systems uh, you know, better than I think anybody else on the planet. That's probably the most important factor right there. Uh, but beyond that, we've got to start working on the tech side to go faster. And I think Secretary Kendall actually, I, I'm really glad he said this. We don't, we don't have a problem ideating. We come up with all kinds of ideas, whether it's from a, from a sailor or a warfare center or industry or academia, we've got tons of great ideas. We even even know how to do the experimentation piece a little bit, but I think Sec Secretary Kennel got it right. Sometimes we, sometimes we do that uh, without focus on solving the problem I just described. I think we got to say, hey, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Let's set up an experiment to go show that this is something that can solve that problem. And then once we find something that works, this is what we can't do. This is what we don't do well. Scale that up. Scale it up and get it to a sailor. Get it to a marine. That is the place where we struggle. So the, the left side of that thing where Secretary Kennel's right, we put all the heat and light, that's actually not broken. It's the right side when you're going from a prototype to something at scale for the fielding, fielding of a technology. That's where we struggle because we don't have the resources. They're in the wrong buckets. They're, they're in Palm 25, not in FY22 today. They're in, in three years down the road in my budget, which is not yet approved. And we've got to figure out how to fix that part because until we do, we're going to always be uh, kind of industry is going to come try to help us, and we're going to say, hey, hey I'll, in 25, I'll have money for you. Talk so I've been you, advocating How do we for, fix that? Well, so I mean, I'm, this, is, this is heresy, but I, I think, so I think you, you got a hedge strategy. What do, what do you need to accomplish a hedge strategy? Uh, you need a hedge fund. And if you have a hedge fund, you need a hedge fund manager. And I don't mean like 10, I mean like a single empowered individual who's accountable to the Congress, to the senior leadership and basically has check writing authority on the hedge fund to go fund companies to go solve the problem. And then when they work, either contract for the service, if I find a UAV that can provide ISR, maybe I don't even wanna buy it. Maybe I just wanna tell the company, hey, if you can put that in a box and provide me data, I will pay you day for day, hour for hour, you're providing me data. And when it's not supporting me, go support the uh, uh, NOAA or some other agency, that's fine. That, I think it's a totally different model, and we don't have a way of actually funding that today at scale. We do little piece parts here and there. We don't do it at scale. Rita, I want to put the, the adversary competitor question to you. Are, you. are there things as you look to Russia, China, maybe others, um, that they're doing really well that you think, why aren't we doing that? That they've, they're not only closing the gap, they've closed it. Well, I think the primary concern, it's not so much based out of any particular knowledge or intelligence that many people in this room don't have a lot more than I do, but it's a little bit like think about landlines and mobile phones, which is because you don't have all the encumbrance, 
which includes your bureaucratic systems, your training, and all the rest, and keeping these capabilities alive, you jump to the new capabilities. So cyber is the obvious one. We've talked about this this morning. Um, and you know, I worry about what are the capabilities, because one of the challenges in the classic kind of offensive, defensive weapons theory, cyber is one of those things you can develop. You, the other side can't see it, <laughs> right? You don't know until it starts being deployed. And so I have worries about those within you know, kind of capability sets just because it's like, well, the most natural thing for them is not to try to, you know, out aircraft carrier us, it's to out cyber us. That would be the natural thing to jump to. And, you know, I'm not sure what our visibility is to really know that. So I, I do have a concern there. Um, the concern isn't by based on knowledge of something particularly happening as much as kind of the natural pattern of what you do is you jump to the next technology platform and what the next sector will be. And, you know, I, I want us to be doing that first and faster. Um, those of us who've been in the room all this morning and listening along know that Ukraine has come up a lot as the obvious example of a big conflict playing out before our eyes in horrific ways right now. Um, from a tech point of view, has anything surprised you? An interesting innovation, something that has worked or not worked in ways that you have found unexpected? So um, I do think that one of the things that has been interesting has been the fact that we have such a large commercial uh, space sector now, that a lot of intel has actually come from the commercial space sector, which has aided a number of things. Uh, everything from uh, actual potential operations or support for the Ukrainians are doing. Tracking but, Russian tanks as they're geo, you know, yeah. geolocating, heading toward yes, the border. exactly. Yeah. But also, even in the question of, of like, uh, morale and what we are fighting for. Like, oh, well, we're not targeting civilians. Okay, here's bombed out pictures of hospitals, <laughs> right, that are taken from commercial sources that are just like, here, here it is. Uh, so I think that has been a surprise. I think also, like, for example, how much you start planning your war efforts based on um, where are uh, smartphone cell signals and GPS signals, you know, a stack of those kinds of things. And that's the kind of thing where it gets to, like both of these things are places where sensors, software, data analysis becomes actually in fact very helpful. Where the cell phone tower is as important as the tank or whatever, the, yeah. the major hardware. Yeah, Admiral. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, I already talked about the quadcopters targeting, that's obviously, uh, obvi that's very clear, everybody's seen that in the news. But also, there's, there's reports of them using quadcopters to actually move plasma, blood, move water. Not a lot, but it's enough to go save a life. So it, that's those kind of things that they're using, I mean, simple technologies to do, you know, logistics. Uh, and so you can, do you think this through to a higher scale, a higher, you know, capacity? You could actually move some serious kit if you needed to with autonomous systems and sensors. Why risk a, a you know, a pilot to do that when you can do this all the time? So that's been happening. And of course, yeah, Elon Musk and, you know, the Starlink, I mean, just incredible capability there that's provided. And then I was with the Mike Brown DIU actually on uh, Friday, and they actually did a lot of the contracts for these commercial satellites that are actually providing support now to Ukraine. So we basically hand it over to them and said, okay, you guys go, go use it. So it's fantastic. And that's, that's totally upsetting kind of the calculus uh, for how Russia is obviously fighting that war. And I think it should put us on notice as well to say these are things we need to be considering for both our use as well as how to counter. And just the notes so the people who are tracking this, these are all things that were just commercially developed out of the commercial sector. Right, and that's part of the reason why the, oh, we do our own missions, our own set of technology and everything else, given the cycle of many billions of dollars and the speed at which these things are iterating, it needs to be time frames, just as the Admiral said, is like, okay, how, how do we go get it right now to help so us solve the problems that we're doing? Yeah, so in fact, Mike Brown, is, he, he coined this first, and I just, I think it's a great term, so I'll say it right here. We need to become a fast follower. We, we, the government, DOD in particular, we need to put our egos away and say, okay, we don't need to design this anymore. Let's just go buy what's already done or go contract for it. Let's go follow what industry is doing because in some cases, they're doing it far better, many cases, most cases probably, they're going far faster than we are. And we just need to take advantage of that. And then, you know, if there's something that, it's, that we do need to go invent because it's, it's got some very unique military thing that's not being done, then we'll go focus on that. But for other stuff, let's just go, let's go find it and go be a fast follower. Admiral's completely right. The other thing is also, there's places we say, okay, I see where the trajectory of, say for example, these kinds of sensing systems are going, or these kinds of drone systems are going. Go and say, hey, could you create a kind of a modular adjunct to your platform that includes X that we can use? So you keep doing the commercial stuff, we'll pay you to have that. So it's, it's a, it, it, there's also possibilities of hybrid. 
has Ukraine shown us the limits of anything in terms of defense technology? Have we glimpsed the limits of cyber, for example? There are a lot of questions about why Russia ha did not take out Ukraine's, I don't know, energy sector at the, at the beginning and turn the lights off and game over. Yeah, I, uh, we I, don't I, quite know. Yeah, I don't think we know. I don't think it's. Yeah. I don't think we know yet. But it's it's clearly showing some of the stress and some of the strains on, uh, you know, a kind of existing military doctrine. There's no question. But I think that. That will be determined in the months and maybe years ahead. Well, I think there is um, two things to say there. One is clearly the first theory of the war that the Russians had was this will be over quickly. We're going to march on Kiev. It's all going to be over. If you have that theory, you're not actually going to unleash a whole bunch of cyber stuff because you think you're basically taking over shop and why try to you know level it. And of course, once the conflict starts happening, like. The people aren't allowing electronic connections, et cetera, and they're, and they're much more uh, tied on top of it. So I think there's just one that's kind of a, a, a deeply erroneous initial theory of the war, which of course is now being retrenched and corrected, and that the civilian casualties and the, the genocide and everything else is, is paying a horrendous price from this you know, terrible activity uh, by the Russians. The other thing is, is I also think that um, you know, we have, um, I, I, don't, I would say it wasn't news, that the Russians experiment with a lot of different cyber things within Ukraine. And that's been, for a number of years, people have been paying attention to it and say, what are the things we do to defend against it? Just one more before we move on from Ukraine. And it's the, I guess to your point, Admiral, that, that it's not an either or, throw out everything that's worked before to, to try something new. I was struck, I was in Ukraine earlier this year and in Donbass, and it's trench warfare. Um, you look around and there was not a lot to suggest that we weren't in 1918. And we've all seen the images of the lines of Russian tanks and the streams of refugees at train stations. I mean, so many things that looked like 20th century wars. Is there any lesson that has been driven home to you as, you know, this, is, this technology has been around for a long time and it works. We need to keep it. We need to invest in something that is tried and true. Yeah, I mean, I do think that, that that's what would be the reluctance if we were to say, nope, we're going to throw out the carriers and submarines, we're going to go all to, you know, to autonomous systems. I mean, there would be the people that say, no, these, these are actually effective. So I, I just don't think that we're in a place you can do that. I, I will tell you, I don't know who said it, somebody this morning made the comment that how they were just absolutely uh, shocked that we are back in basically trench warfare. I mean, the picture of that apartment building that's been the middle of is, is totally blown away. Uh, it's just incredible that we're there. And again, it just goes to show you that, you know, a single human being, in this case Putin, can basically unleash that kind of devastation and, and put the entire world kind of at risk. And, and we're still here today. What's but, it been like watching those pictures? I mean, just inside the hallways of the Pentagon. So I, I've been to Kiev. Yeah. I, I went to Kiev uh, yeah, on a Kodel years ago. And uh, I, I just remember thinking, what a beautiful city. I remember walking the city one evening, had a, had a couple hours, met, met a bunch of people, incredibly resilient, independent, just wanted to have their own country, and you know, here, here we are today. That was, that's 20 years ago, but uh, yeah, it's just devastated by it, so yeah. The, the one thing I wanna add is I, is I think that, imagine a little bit of what, if we had, if we were more accelerating to the modern technologies. Like when we're shipping howitzers, precision munitions, other kinds of things which are excellent systems with capabilities and we're trying to help and we're doing our best to be helpful, think if we were shipping a whole bunch of drones Right. Think if we were shipping, you know, a bunch of stuff that was much lower, could be manufactured much higher cost. I mean, we're doing that too. Yeah. You know, but, as you know, like, like at that scale, you mean? At, like <laughs> at a scale of a thousand x, right? The field of battle might be entirely different, and the fact that we look like we're fighting a 1980s, 1990s war might actually look very different. So I, I think that actually that emphasizes kind of a key. Uh, vulnerability that we have is is as we try to scale to the thousands of devices like quadcopters or UASs, I don't think we can do that as quickly as we need to today. And so I think that there's a challenge here is you think about what I would call the shipyard of the future. What does the shipyard of the future look like when you're building an unmanned surface vessel or, you know, don't, don't make shipyard think you can't make something that flies. What does that manufacturing of the future look like for these kind of systems and sensors? I think it's totally different. And I, I think if you look at the way we do business today, you've got a single digit number of primes that are highly vertically integrated. They tend to want to either own or have t very tight controls of the entire supply chain. 
I think it's a different model, and I think it's more of a horizontally integrated mesh network of corporations that all feed into in kind of, I'll use Elon term, gigafactories, where you're assembling and doing final checkout and test of the device you're making before it gets shipped out to the field. I think it's a totally different model, and I think it's actually a really exciting model for the entire US economy, because I think you can do this in all kinds of diff different parts of ours. It's not just quadcopters, it's cars. It, it, it could be anything, but I think we need to look hard at how you do this and how you change you know, all the interstate commerce laws. I think it's a different model that if you did this right, I think it would ignite American innovation kind of akin to Freedom's Forge back in World War II when we cranked out more stuff than the rest of the world could keep up with. And if we do this the right way and have the agility because we use digital engineering principles to design and build the devices wherever they are, I can rapidly modify and change them to get after that agility I talked about. And so I can always keep other nations always on their heels because they will not be able to keep up because I contend that it's American innovation collaborative spirit, ability to share ideas openly and honestly that gives us the advantage that no one else in the world can keep up with, certainly not China or Russia. And that's our secret, that's our secret power. That is our secret power. <laughs> Applause one. Um, I am gonna save a few minutes for questions, but since you raised China, I do wanna give you both a, the chance to quickly weigh in on another thing that's very clearly on people's minds that has emerged in the conversations as today has unfolded, which is apply all this to Taiwan and what technology would be useful, would be required to defend Taiwan, should that become necessary, because President Biden says we're committed to do it. So I think if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, I mean, clearly you can see that autonomy, and small, agile, many. I mean, what if what if Taiwan had a, thousands of small, agile, many type devices that could provide, maybe, maybe they're deterring, maybe they're actually just surveilling, maybe they're actually trying to take out other, other things that are flying in the sky. That would be one area. Is there where flying things or in the sea? Or could whatever. be both. Okay. You could have undersea, you could be on the surface, you could be in the air. And that's the beauty of these things. And you could have them stored on the beach, ready to go whenever you need them. Uh, completely agree with what the Admiral just said. The other thing I'd say is, it's not news, we've actually heard it here on the stage uh, during the, uh, the forum, but uh, a vast majority of the advanced semiconductor manufacturings in Taiwan, that is a economic risk, that is a national security risk, that is a, a number of things. Um, part of what, how that's made me reflect is, you know, I uh, hope that Congress realizes that they are part of the effort. The speed at which getting the CHIPS Act through, doing more than that is absolutely critical. Um, you know, the, just as I, when I was saying like software, it's also of course, like how powered is your software? What can your software do? All of the semiconductors, whether it's anything from chip specializing in AI to obviously, um, you know, phones and all the rest of the things all come down to that semiconductors and the fact that we ourselves have not, uh, have allowed this uh, strategic capabilities to lapse within ourselves and a, you know, a number of close partners is a disaster. And uh, it, the, I think one of the things that, that is fortunate is that is it shared across the whole world? It's shared with China in that case, but it's a but it's a, 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 a it's it's a, a supply chain sensitivity that's one of the worst I've ever seen. I think you've just given us an, an actionable item here. You're saying if conflict with China is even remotely on the theoretical horizon, the U.S. needs to get its act together pronto and make sure we're not totally reliant for semiconductors and other. Last year was 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 not soon enough. Let's open it to questions. I'm gonna start on this side of the room, the gentleman in the front, and then we'll go back uh, to the table back here. Here we go. If you wanna introduce yourself, that would be great. Hi. Uh, Admiral, uh, good, to, good to have you today. I couldn't shout loud enough uh, about your comments, Admiral, about America's natural advantage for collaboration, which includes our close allies. But something that you haven't said on this panel, which I'm actually kind of disappointed about, so I'm gonna be pointed, um, procurement reform. Right, yeah. uh, definitely uh, Secretary Kendall alluded to it, right? The problem of years of requirements and years uh, are putting it behind. I would say, I work in the semiconductor industry, right? I would say my estimation as also an Army officer is we're at least a decade behind in the general technology out in the fleeter force versus where commercial technology is. That is yeah. unsustainable. Yeah. How do we fix that? Yeah. But isn't it procurement reform that we'll get? So here, here's again, back to my opening statement about there's two problem sets. One is continuing to build the, the, the larger complex systems and sensors that we're doing, carriers, submarines, high-end fighters, missile systems. That system is, you know, it's the DoD 5000, JSIDS process, if you're familiar with that. That system relies upon requirements, and again, 
when you're building a nuclear submarine or an aircraft carrier, you probably want the requirements process, and you probably want to have a fairly methodical, uh, well-laid-out plan, well-planned pl budget. So I think for that, you, can you make improvements on it? Absolutely. But for the most part, at the end of the day, you get a, you get a high-end fighter. You get a very capable Virginia-class submarine. You're going to get an amazing Columbia-class class submarine. So that, for that stuff, it works. Can I improve it a little bit? I'm sure you can, but, but I wouldn't focus there. It's the other stuff. It's the software-based digital systems that we need to change the model for. And that's what we need to go solve, because right now, we are basically trying to use the same system, the same JSIDS process that we use to build the big complex things to buy the digital software-based things, and it doesn't work. And any of you out there in the industry knows that, you know that, and you're frustrated by that. So we need a different model. And again, this is, I think, where you start thinking about defining it as a problem and then using different ways of contracting. And so let me tell you what I'm doing. So I've got an initiative I call it Scout. Okay, I am scouting for new ways of doing business, scouting for new opportunities, scouting for new technologies. And what I am doing, I'm actually partnering with, with actually Southcom, and I don't know if the general is still here or not, but I'm partnering with the JIF South Command in Key West to help them go find drug runners. And I'm going to mostly use autonomous COTS based for the most part. There may be a couple things that are government, but mostly COTS, commercial off the shelf systems and sensors, and make it less about the thing and really more about the data that comes from the thing and the software that I applied to the data to go find the ship or the submerged, semi submersible that's carrying drugs. That is going to use different contracting methods. So I actually already did this a couple months ago. We went out with something called a commercial solutions opening. Basically, I define a problem, I go out with a broad area announcement to the industry, say, here's my problem, who's got ideas? I had 85 companies come in with ideas, we kind of went through them, down-selected them to three categories. One were, yep, let's go do, two, go do some homework and come back and let's try again, and three was not, not now, maybe later, but not now. So we, we're in the process, I'm doing sprints right now with that process to go find ways to go solve that drug problem. I'm going to do an in-water demo sometime in the spring next year to go show folks that this works. If it works, as I suspect it will, then you can see there's many applications for the technologies that I'm developing here. Here's the problem. Still don't have somebody that can scale that up. Money, the checkbook, the hedge fund I talked about, we don't have that. So for me to go do that now, I'm gonna have to go knock on some friends' doors on the hill and say, hey, uh, I got a great idea here if you think you could fund this. That's, that's broken. There ought to be a process that's repeatable and ready to go that a single empowered leader can go do this kind of stuff. So I've kind of proposed the idea of, why don't you make somebody ex an experimentation fleet commander and make that person accountable to work with the, the numbered fleet commanders and the MEF commanders, Marine Exper Expeditionary Force commanders, the three-star Marine commanders, in the field, around the world, find their problems, and then put together a series of CSOs, commercial solutions openings, where I go find people that have solutions to solve their problems. I set up relevant experiments in relevant environments, First, I'll do it digitally, I'll do some modeling and sim stuff, but eventually I want to get wet, I want to get dirty with stuff to go prove it to a marine or a sailor that it works. And when it does, we then got to figure out how to scale it up to either contract for the service or go buy it in, in mass to go give it to them to go operate with. That, that's, I think that's how you do this. I mean, that's, you, you, we've got to find a way to go do this. Thanks. Hi, Janet Benyehuda, Truman National Security Project. I want to tease you out, Admiral, on this concept of becoming a fast follower. How do we get to the place where when military planning exercises like the global uh, engagement of the force or other big out-year strategic planning exercises think about private sector partnering the way that we think about partner nation partnering? Because we have this emergent dynamic where we show up in theater and it's like, oh my god, all these commercial imagery guys are here. That's so great. It's so useful. But not every conflict is going to draw as much attention as Ukraine. So how do you count on it when you don't have a mutual defense agreement or things of that nature, but increasingly need to rely upon that kind of capability? So uh, to be clear, are you talking more about, are you talking about international stuff or are you talking more about the process for how you do this kind of on call when there's a when there's a crisis or there's some demand. I'm broadly talking about harnessing the capability of commercially available yeah. okay. assets, yeah. but for our own military purposes. Okay, so I think again, we need to develop kind of that single process owner, and you need to have you need to develop the machine that does this all the time. It's not like once a year or every other year impact. It's an experimentation on demand that this leader has the authority and monies to go pull together the teams. I, I would use the Navy's Warfare Centers. We got 
25 or so thousand folks out there. I would tap into those folks to help me do these experiments. But I would have this machine that's always running. And so there, if there is a crisis that comes up, it's a little outside of something we've already done, we can go, we can go model that. And we can go see, see if I got something that may already work. Or if I don't, I'll go put out a CSO for that as well and go try to find solutions. So I think you've got to have a machine that just, this is what they do all the time. It's not ad hoc. It's not just for Ukraine. It's not just for Task Force 59's uh, IBX, which is what they did in Bahrain back in uh, February, if you know anything about that. It's not that. It's something that's always happening. So when there's a crisis, you're already doing it. It's, it's like nothing. It's like it's just another day at the office. That's what we need to do. Uh, let's see if we can get in two more in a lightning round. I'll take you, sir, in the front row, and then we'll go back to this row, and we'll hear both questions, and then you can both dive in as you like. Please. Miles Krieger. Um, in the, uh, the United States and Israel are working on Iron Beam, which is a lot less expensive than Iron Dome, and it's laser technology. Um, are you going to be using this technology for defense against other um, uh, other uh, situations? Uh, what are you going to do to defend against the hypersonic missile? Yeah, there, we're looking at all kinds of technology. Obviously, there's laser defense stuff that we're working a lot in. There's other, there's other directed energy stuff we're working in. So there's a great deal of work. I'm not going to talk a lot, great deal about that because that's sensitive. But we're working in different areas. You, you mentioned Israel. I think it was two panels ago. There was a discussion about working more closely with our international partners. Okay, so I've got, a, I've got an international hat. I'm the senior national naval representative. So I meet with a lot of our close allies, and we talk about. I'll use the, the R word, requirements, which I don't like, but we talk about common requirements. And one of the things we're talking about is how do we engage both of our respective industries to go solve a similar problem? So there's a lot of appetite right now with particularly the United Kingdom and Australia for us to become interchangeable, okay? We've always talked about being interoperable. Interchangeable is like a step up. Interoperable, I can talk on the radio back and forth, might be able to give some tasking, but when I'm interchangeable, I can literally fly my quadcopter from U.S. destroyer, it goes out and does a mission, it goes and lands on a British frigate, it can be download all the data, the data can be mensurated, I can retask it, recharge it, can fly off and do another mission, and fly somewhere else. That's interchangeable. To do that, I contend you have to start at the very beginning. In science and technology, you start developing ideas and concepts, and then when you get to the, the part where you're actually building the specification, you know, the, the blueprint as it will, once you, as you build that, if you do that together, you can then go to your respective industries and your respective countries to go solve it and build it. And then when you get, come back later, it's interchangeable. Sorry. I have so many follow-up questions about the intelligence implications of interoperability, which maybe Bill Burns will take off. He's up next, but I promised one last question to you, sir. Here we go. So I, I want to ask about the strategic implications of uh, something just over the horizon, which is quantum computing, uh, which could well mean that uh, encrypted communications are impossible. Talk about that, please. Um, well, actually, I, um, the uh, save now, decrypt later is the thing I'm most concerned about in this, and depends on what it is. I actually don't have concerns that, that uh, because I know of a number of good work that's being done to figure out how to also do quantum encryption. So it isn't that encryption goes away, it's that there's a gap where some, some signals that could be extremely important and also not just immediately timely could be vulnerable in that, in that transition. So it's not that you couldn't later be able to uh, re-emerge with a good secure in infrastructure, but that that transition could be challenging. The well, only thing I'll say is that, it, that my organization, we're not doing anything with computing. We're doing algorithms. We're letting, there's others in the government doing the computing, and we're very closely tied in with that. We're doing a lot of work with quantum algorithms, quantum sensing, quantum timing and quantum networking. So we're doing a lot in those other areas because those also have huge implications for accuracy of your precision navigation and timing, targeting, all kinds of applications that are really important for us. I think you've just provided us a beautiful segue to the next session. Admiral uh, Lauren Selby and Reid Hoffman, thank you so much. Fascinating thank, conversation. Thank you. Thank you.